Thank you, Costa. And I want to include my husband, Randy Orwin. We're both from Rainbow Beach, which is at the other end of the Great Sandy National Park between Noosa and um, the uh, Gari, the, what, that people may know as Fraser Island, that's been renamed. I want to talk to you about making magic happen because most people know what a bioblitz is and how it's run and what it, it's set out to do in terms of citizen science. And we want to talk about uh, the things that we're doing on Cubby Cubby and Butchula country and acknowledge that they are and have been the custodians with evidence of their occupation of our area for 60,000 years. So they've already been looking after it and we want to help them do that. Our Um, it's a very beautiful part of the country and we know that we're trying to think about inspiration, impact and influence in this conference. So I want you to think about what those three words mean as we go through talking about how we make magic happen in Kalula. So internalise those. Just a quick hands up, who's done a Bioblitz? Who's run a Bioblitz? <laughs> that's you, yes, that's, that's just one group at one Bioblitz. Um, who's run a Bioblitz? Okay, who's never attended a Bioblitz? Just a few, okay. Um, I'm not quite sure what they're all like, but certainly the main game, the minimum viable product is a bunch of people go out and collect some data. And we've collected a lot of data, it's gone from paper-based, to now into iNaturalist. And I was thinking about this last night after the great talk yesterday morning about getting the data onto web, web, uh, Wikimedia and Wikipedia and all of that. And I thought, what's in it for you was another question that was asked a lot. And what's in it for the individual is the experience that they have at that event. But they then contribute to the next circle out is the local group like us at Kalula Coast Care and what we know about the environment we're trying to protect. And then we send it up to our council, it then goes up to state, it's in those GBIF and those global things. But it dawned on me that we also have an interplanetary role because the data we're getting is informing the biomes that they're trying to test on Earth to go to Mars. So when you come to the Kulula Bioblitz, you're helping us settle Mars potentially. So even though that's our minimum viable product, it could have a very big interplanetary um, impact. So we have three types of bio blitzes now. We've been running them since 2018 on the invitation of John Sinclair, the man who saved Fraser Island at the time from logging and sand mining. And he invited us to host one because he couldn't get a permit to do one there. So we had a great mentor at the beginning. We are now also run a mini bioblitz whenever we get the opportunity to do that. And we recently ran an arachnids one. And that was because a Danish scientist who just done his, um, his undergraduate by research and then was doing a master's by research and his boss was into Australian spiders, came out to spend some time. So we did a mini uh, bioblitz just for a weekend, about 25 people, lots of locals got involved in that. And we had an amazing time scaring ourselves to death in the middle of the night out in the rainforest. And we do these responsive ones, so if an opportunity arises. So we've run a moth blitz because we discovered, amongst other things, a new moth. And the person came up from Melbourne who was an expert in those moths and we ran a mini moth blitz because there was an opportunity that was responsive to something we discovered. He turns out now to be the CEO of CSIRO, Professor Doug Kilton. So that's very handy for us. But it's about three things to me when I'm designing a bioblitz because I'm not an environmental scientist. My PhD is in virtual reality. I worked for 10 years as an avatar, which is about as far as you can get from nature. So I, I wanted to design an experience for the people when they came that was more than being a data collector army. So the three things we wanted to happen was lots of learning, 
for me, especially seeing I'd never run one or been to one, making things and experiencing the place that we were in. The first learning was for the citizen scientists themselves and we embed workshops at the beginning in technology. We work, Michelle and her two boys come and help Randy to teach people how to use iNaturalist. But there's much more learning that's going on in the field. We have 20 scientists usually and we run from 7 a.m. with the first um, bird chorus monitoring through to 2 a.m. with the late night bird, uh, birds and owls and all those mammals in the rainforest and frogs and, and all the insects that come out at night. So there's lots of opportunity to learn from scientists. There's lots of opportunity for people to learn from each other because they come back to a base camp and there's lots of ID going on in all sorts of shapes and forms. And we try and make a lot of scientific ID um, happen at the event where they see a huge microscope. So Eva's here from MRCCC who lend us their $12,000 microscope that's projected up to this size. And so people can come and put their zombie ants underneath that. It's about learning for research students. So we work really hard to get a lot of young people to our events. We tap into all the university bio societies and all of those Facebook groups and we get everyone to ask their kids who are at uni and to ask their friends and we give discounts and subsidise people with housing and all sorts of ways to get young people there. And they bring their youth and their energy and their willingness to learn and a whole lot of stuff they've learned at uni that they've never got to apply in the field. And my own daughter as a science student says, I wish our lecturers were doing bio blitzes when I was at uni doing science. But we also let kids come and we're learning how to let younger and younger kids come because our partnership with our Aboriginal communities has said they take their kids everywhere from when they're born. So we're learning how do we engage kids more into the BioBlitz and help them collect data because they've got a really good eye as we just heard from Kit. For example, when we were out listening for the um, ground parrots, the whole crowd is standing there looking up and but one of the kids is going, is that one? And there it was at their feet. Wouldn't have seen it but for the kids being there. So they learn technology in full-on workshops and next time we go actually we're going to actually try and run some workshops online before the event to get more people more adept at using um, iNaturalist. Uh, we, we teach a lot about photography. So we have spider experts who teach how to photograph spiders. One of the tips for that if you need it is put a rock in the middle of a tray of water and most spiders will run to the edge of the rock, touch the water and go, oh, we don't like water, and they'll run around the edges and then stop and wait for the tide to go out and you can photograph them. Um, but how to photograph fungi from all the sides that you need to photograph them. How to photograph trees where you get the seed, the flower, the bark, the whole tree, the leaf up close, the underside of the leaf, all those kind of things. So the scientists help us teach the participants how to get really good photos that people can ID from and then the ones who are online can see what you've got much easier than taking a bush from 20 metres away. We learn skills by doing them. So in the field, this is Robert White with our spider people out in the field collecting specimens, IDing them in the field, preserving those that aren't already identified. I think the first time we had 37 new spiders um, that were undescribed by science. And then one of his protégés, who was only 16 as one of our leaders, came and found 42. So he beat the expert. Uh, we do have presentations as well, formal presentations by scientists. Some people only come to present, but that's for people who don't go on our night survey. So after dinner, because we have a dinner at the event, we have dinner with the scientists, you then can stay and there's presentations into the evening and uh, some people then can go home to bed while others go out in the field to the wee hours. And we run a total nature journaling program 
in parallel with the, uh, the Bioblitz. So you can come and work with Dion Dior, who did the workshop here on Monday. And Dion will teach you how to keep field notebooks and transfer them into journals. And that's a whole stream right through. They have a scientist with them, a different scientist with them each day. And then they come back and they draw during the um, ID making and they get taught how to do the nature drawing back in, with, you know, time to work their journals. And at the end, they'll end up with several pages in their journals. And I really encourage you to try and include both scientific art, which that is, or if you want to include um, interpretive art, it's a great way to add value and also tap into another audience who may not come for science because they think of themselves as artists. So the other thing is about learning together and this photo is very precious to us. This is a round table of all of the elders who came and their families and all of our scientists where we had a round table discussion before the day began on the second day of one of our bio blitzes on how do we build bio blitzes that take into account of traditional knowledges and culture? How do we plan bio blitzes so they, they aren't culturally inappropriate by taking people to places that they shouldn't attend if you have gendered sites and sacred sites? And how do we uh, support Indigenous participation? And so we now sponsor completely accommodation, meals, travel and registration for up to 10 Cubby Cubby or Bachelor people for every event. And we're trying to make find more money to make that a bigger group. And we have people making, and one of the most exciting things to do, of course, is to make a new discovery. And we started that with a very small moth, only three millimeters in size. But the moment a discovery was made, it changed the whole tone of the event. And that instigated another moth blitz within three weeks and five of those different species in that family were found and so it was it, it's an exciting moment but you don't have to make a new discovery because you can make all these other things you can make friends you can make art you can make memories and we have a whole lot of merch that we try and help people remember the bio blitz it's about making an impact through the media. And I want to mention this because this is about influence and taking that stone that we throw in the pool at the BioBlitz and then taking that out as far as we can. So we have a lot of media that we concentrate on after the event. So whether it's newspapers, kids doing television, the not so young doing television, radio and radio is great because they can record a whole lot of stuff and they'll just use little segments for months at the MRCCC meeting we did interviews that we just played yesterday and that was over a month ago so as many papers as you can local national state the science media um, our scientists take what they've discovered and publish in journals and magazines so there's there's the high level journals but there's also just nature magazines and we made a documentary on how we run our bio blitz because the models seem to be so different everyone does it a different way and so there is a documentary that you can get on our bio blitz website it's an immersive experience and if daryl's here that's my joke immersive and she's in the gotta have a joke gotta have a joke for daryl from kiwal and that's two of our indigenous participants getting in under the jetty looking for bats and spiders under there. It's about experiencing, just being there in nature is a really, really important part. So people have time to experience a really unique environment. It's completely sand based with rainforests and huge eucalypt trees growing in sand that can only grow there because a mycelium feeds them the nutrients off the sand. And then there's patterned fens that only Gari and, and Karula have at sea level anywhere in the world. So there's some beautiful things to experience. 
but it's also about experience surprises. If if you could have heard, if you heard the noise of an earthquake level Richter scale measurable scream, that was Sandra Tuzinski, our mycologist of 20 years, seeing this species for the first time after 20 years on a weekend where we had a bio blitz in the pouring rain. And of course, with a week of rain leading up to it, the fungi went nuts. And so everyone had amazing surprise experiences. But it's also about taking time to be quiet and peaceful. So we run an event called The Listening because you rarely ever see these birds except when you've got a kid with you who can point one out at your feet. And people just go out and onto the Noosa Plain, into the wetlands and stand quietly as the sun goes to darkness and they just listen for these parrots. And it's one of those absolutely peaceful, magic moments of a whole group of people just hearing nature. They experience wonder if you draw their attention to it. This is the zombie ant. Gets a fungus in it, drives it out to the end of the branches, the fungus takes over and grows its fruit out of the ant. They experience awe <laughs> because this is the largest black butt by diameter in the whole of Australia. It's 15 and a half metres in circumference and I know to the Tasmanians that's just a twig. But in black butt terms, it's the fattest. And it's been struck by lightning and inside it there's a whole bat colony. It's large enough to, for 10 people to fit inside. And it, it just stills you when you see it. And then you remember that that whole forest used to be that size tree and they logged it all. And only that this was struck by lightning did it survive. And they experience culture because we're embedding indigenous knowledge better and better each time. And we have that knowledge sharing between groups of, who've got both um, Western science and indigenous knowledge there. And we have art shows and we have Sometimes we get to experience new life. All things that make a bioblitz totally magical. But one of the great things is, and we get told it all the time in our evaluations, is I spend a whole weekend with people who are my tribe, who think like me. I didn't have to justify feeling excited about nature. I was with my tribe and they were recharged by that to go on to do some of the very difficult work that they do. And it's magical when you get that whole thing come together for 48 hours of learning, experiencing, discovering and being in awe of nature around you. Well, well, do you want to come up with any, and answer questions? We'll take a, a question or two. I can see that lunch is served, so if you want to start to grab lunch, feel free, and we'll just do questions as we go, and that way we're not holding you back. So if there's anyone outside that wants to come in and start eating, feel free, and we'll keep it. We'll take a couple of questions. Um, have I got one there? Not so much a question, just a reflection. Truly. Um uh, it moved for me as a participant last year from a scientific uh, event to a magical event. It really, there was that transition. So thank you very much both for your work. Thanks, Martin. If you want to ask any data questions or curating data, Randy is your man. He handles that, all AI naturalists, and he's working really hard with WildNet, and they're working on a protocol for getting citizen science data accepted into WildNet that's been created at BioBlitzes. So hopefully, oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, first get hat, my first get hat. Thank you, because it is a land and sea. Um, that was a very impressive event that you run. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering how many people are involved in organising that event each year and how long does it take you to bring all that together? Okay. If you're smart, it will involve 10 or 12 people. 
Uh, last year I was really sick and we weren't sure we would be able to do it. So Randy and I did that whole event in three months. And now we have a great team of 10 who are our turtle carers, who in the off season don't have a lot to do except rescue turtles. And they've taken on all the logistics. So the event, the halls, the bookings, the motels, the hotels, all of that stuff. Randy has built the most amazing spreadsheet where I can now just write what are my funding sources, what are my um, deliverables, and what are the things I'm buying. And as I do it, it automatically generates a spreadsheet that tallies everything that's spent, everything that's income, and then I can analyze it with all the tables automatically populate. And I literally fill in three columns and then type an amount. So that's going to be a great template that we have in the future. As many people as you can get. <laughs> so I've got a question about um, data. Do you go out and recruit um, scientists, experts to from all over to ID your observations or do you just rely on the scientists you've invited for the event? We do encourage our scientists to spend a lot of time doing IDs. Um, we recruit scientists from, I mean, from people who are very high profile, John Sands, who was the chief entomologist at CSIRO, who's retired now. Um, so very high profile scientists that we've had in, but we also have a lot of amazing amateur naturalists who are well known. So at the last BioBlitz, one of our amateur naturalists made IDs on about 850 observations. Um, and so then we have a group of people who can't attend the BioBlitz because of health reasons or things like that. We have a, a gentleman who is a specialist in Lepidoptera and he actually watches iNaturalist and as those things come in, he IDs those as well. Um, so we have a really great community of folks from Australia and from other places who now we know, we see their names all the time on our IDs. So we get really good, accurate records. Currently we're sitting at about 67% our research grade in iNaturalist, um, which is which we think is pretty pretty good um, in, in doing those kinds of things. And so our focus really is about, it is that, that magic experience, but we back that up with really good scientists who come and help us provide that good data. And we're now planning, because of you, a data hackathon after the next BioBlitz, where we're going to try and get the help we need to do the whole wiki wikification of that data. Because we've been looking for a way to capture all of the research that's done in our area by the universities, as well as all our own data, and like a head slap moment, I should have been putting this stuff in Wikipedia all along because I don't have a database attached to the website. I am curious, given that there's lots of people here looking to learn from you and all the amazing and incredible things that you've done, knowing your background and understanding the idea of reflecting on failure, do you have an interesting failure that you really found powerful to learn from? that you've changed in the time that you've done this? Good question. I think, I think the biggest issue for me is I'm not an environmental scientist and everyone assumes that I am. So they think that I know all the scientific names of things and all of that stuff. And I should have asked more of those people to help me design things so that it was much better scientifically. We tried for as much rigor as we could, but we didn't openly just say, hey, I'm in, my specialty is virtual reality. I worked for 10 years as an avatar, not nature. What are we doing wrong? You know, give us more ideas. So asking those people, and we should have got the indigenous people involved way sooner. Two good points. Now, as a um, manager of a stage, I figured rather than have a big rush on food, I'd take more questions. <laughs> and, and that way now when you move up there, you can see it's free range. <laughs> so in case I get uh, assessed as being, you know, eight minutes over, uh, 12 minutes over, 
But we wanted to get those questions in. What a fantastic project. Um, Linda and Randy, Randy, thank you for, for sharing with us and thanks for the great questions, everyone.